Regardless of what kind of week you had, I would invite you now to, well, quieting your mind takes more than 30 seconds, so I won't invite you to quiet your mind, but still your heart and your soul and prepare yourselves for worship as we listen to the prelude. Good morning. Stand for our opening prayer. Together. From the cowardness that dares not face the new truth, from the laziness that is contented with half truth, from the arrogance that thinks it's known all truth, good Lord, deliver me. Amen. And your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinance. I am severely afflicted. Give my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offering of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinance. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever. In the end. Amen. Call for all the children. Sharice. Do you think that they're talking about on the bulletin? Yes. 
God's word is a lamp to my feet. Now, what do you think that means? That's a little tougher, actually. Um,
The scripture, the parable of the sower, Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the crowd stood on the beach. And he, and he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to the sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. So in the old days, I used to take tour groups to the Soviet Union. And I was there about a dozen times over the 1980s. And one year that I was there with a group, it was the thousandth anniversary of Christianity coming to Russia. <clears throat> so there were celebrations, particularly in the Orthodox churches around the country. And we went to the Orthodox seminary in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, before that Petrograd, before that St. Petersburg. When I was there, it was Leningrad. We went to the Orthodox Seminary and spent the afternoon. And at the end of the afternoon, we were invited to come to Vespers. And the priest who had been our host said, in a thousand years, we've done this several hundred thousand times. And so a member of our group looked at him and said, why do you do this at the end of the afternoon and the beginning of the evening every day for a thousand years? And he said, it's simple. What could be more important than hallowing even the moment when darkness falls? Huh. What could be more important than making even the moment when darkness falls a holy moment? The moment when darkness falls is different for each of us. Perhaps it's waiting for test results that we do not want to hear about. Perhaps it's because someone we love has relapsed yet again. Perhaps it's because a friendship or a relationship or a marriage is ending. Perhaps it's because we are losing or have already lost in the course of these days someone dear to us. The moment when darkness falls. And this ancient priest in an ancient country with an ancient church said, what could be more important than even making holy that moment when darkness falls? Clearly, we don't want to dwell in that darkness. We don't want to stay in that moment. But that moment, more than once, we will encounter in our lives. And the invitation to keep that moment, hard as it is, sacred, by looking for God's presence in it, is a serious invitation. The fact that we don't want to stay there in that place forever also means that this wonderful line from the psalm that Christy just read and that we learned about here in the children's sermon, that God's word, or when a real word of God comes to us, it's like a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We know what the darkness feels like which is why it is so important when light finally breaks through. The psalmist knew this 3,000 years ago, and, and it's a reminder for us to reflect on it again this morning. 
As I looked at this text this week, it seemed to me that the light, which we learned about, can help you one foot in front of the other. That's it. It's not like forever. It's right where you are. But that light sometimes illuminates the fact that, <clears throat> rather surprisingly, we were on the right path. Sometimes we're not sure. And sometimes when the light comes, we go, well, hey, that wasn't bad. I'm actually on the path I should be on. Years ago, I was involved in a, an act of nonviolent civil disobedience at a nuclear weapons plant not too far from here. We had gone on Pentecost Sunday thinking that maybe the spirit of the God that Pentecost talks about, if we just shared that spirit on the lawn of this place, something about our fears and worries about nuclear war might be allayed. We didn't even get through all 21 verses. The police moved quickly. And then, two days later in court, we expected to get the same $15 fine that 100 other people had gotten. I'd gotten that $15 fine before. Another 98 people had as well. Christine and I knew where we were going for lunch. This would be counting one's chickens uh, before they're hatched. Uh, would be the title of this sermon, <clears throat> since we knew what we were going for lunch and probably knew what we were going to eat. Until the judge looked at two of us and said, haven't I seen some of you before? And we were sort of honored to be recognized and said, yes. He said, I'm tired of seeing you 90 days. So the $15 fine became 90 days. And two hours later, we were on the way to Bill Ricca House of Detention. And so as we were walking up there, handcuffed with some other guys, two things happened, one of them funny and one of them very important. The guy I was handcuffed to, I hadn't had a shower in two days, hadn't shaved, I had my clerical collar on, I didn't look my best. I wasn't having lunch with Christine, I was, well, shackled to him, going to Bill Ricca for three months. And so he looks at me, I don't know where this came from, and says, when we get inside, do you think you could get me like a radio? And I, I didn't know what else to say to the poor guy. I said, do I look like I have the authority to get you a radio? He goes, hmm, how about a Bible? I said, that I can work on. I'll work on a Bible. To my right was my friend, and he said as we walked almost in the door, he said, you know what, Michael? All I can say is, we wouldn't be here if Jesus didn't want us to be. All right. That's what I needed to hear. I needed to have a little light put on the path. I needed to hear a word that I thought came from God through my friend who said, we wouldn't be here if Jesus didn't want us to be here. Sometimes when the light comes on, I like that lantern. We should get one of those for our house. We have a fairly crappy nightlight, I would say, and so uh, that's much improved. Sometimes when the light comes on, you find out you are on the right path, or at least it confirms your intuition, or at least it's a nice thing to hear, and then you'll see where things lead. But sometimes it's not bad news to have the flashlight come on. And sometimes it comes from a friend. And that's as much a word of the Lord as hearing a voice in the clouds that sounds like Charlton Heston. Sometimes when the light comes on, we find out that we're on the wrong path. This is not quite as welcome. Sometimes we don't even know we've veered from the path. Sometimes we don't know how many exits we took and how lost we've gotten. There's still ground under our feet, and so we assume, well, we're on some path, and you're on some path, but sometimes it's not the path leading you toward health and sanity and safety. Sometimes we don't know how far we've drifted until that light comes on, the light the psalmist is talking about. And sometimes it comes on because of a 
wonderful text or word that comes back to us spoken long, long ago. A lot of the people that I work with in recovery will say to me, one day I just looked at where I was and wondered how in the world I had gotten here. How in the name of God did I make so many exits in the dark and wound up here? And then sometimes they'll say, no little boy or little girl says to their parents, I can't wait to grow up and be an addict. So how in the world do we get where we wound up? The first verse of the first psalm actually helps us to see. It says, <clears throat> the healthy person isn't strolling with those who are wicked, isn't stopping to chat <clears throat> with those who are evil, and doesn't wind up sitting down in a circle of people who are scoffing and disrespectful. Notice what happened in the first verse of the first psalm, not even one page of this wonderful book that we're entrusted with. It's the trajectory of how we get to where we wound up. Gradually. Gradually. Well, I was just strolling, talking to people, really. And then I found myself, well, stopping and standing and getting involved in a real conversation. And then before I knew it, I was sitting down in the circle and felt like I was part of it. And then I asked myself, how did I get here? The answer is gradually, one step at a time, as Sharice pointed out with the kids. One step at a time. But when the light of God shines on this and we realize we made a wrong turn or two, the good news is that how you get out of it is also, frankly, one step at a time, one day at a time. The way you get out is the way you got in, <clears throat> gradually, and you're grateful for each day you've got. Sometimes when God's word shines that light, it's confirming of us, and we go, oh, whew, that's good, I was on the right path. And sometimes it shows us how far we have drifted and offers an alternative. And sometimes it comes from knowing these old texts that are at the heart of our faith. But sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes it doesn't seem as though there is any path in front of us at all in life. It's not a question whether it's a good one or a bad one, a healthy one or unhealthy one. It doesn't look like there's any way forward. The opening line of Dante's Inferno, which they taught us when I was 15, and I was worried about whether my acne would ever clear up, so I believe I missed some of the import of this. In the middle years of my life, I found myself in a deep, dark wood, and the way ahead was not clear. It was a little early for me to hear that. Once you have a few miles on the odometer, that begins to ring true. In the middle years of my life, I found myself in a deep, dark wood, and the way ahead was not clear. It wasn't whether there was a good path or a bad path. There doesn't seem to be any path. And there are moments like that. And sometimes the word then comes to us, and the metaphor for me this morning so a word from a friend, a word from the text, from the scripture. Sometimes the word comes to us directly from the creation, from the universe, from the cosmos. Here's my image of what happens when it looks like nothing is happening and actually we just have to wait a minute. Twice, Christine and I have gone to New Mexico for the festival of the sand cranes. Um, these guys fly from Nebraska every year and uh, winter in New Mexico, and there's 18,000 of them on federally protected land. They've been doing it for thousands of years, these cranes. And so in November each year, there's a special week that people can come and experience what that is like. And so twice, we've gone to this place, <clears throat> and I have to say, 
You have to leave the hotel at, at four in the morning, get there at five in the morning. And the first year we were there, it was five in the morning, pitch dark, it was 22 degrees, it was snowing, and I couldn't see Christine's face next to mine. <clears throat> I leaned over to someone I thought was her and said, when does the fun part begin? Because right now I can't see, hear, or feel anything except 22 degree temperatures and snow, and I think it's you I'm talking to, but we signed up for this, and we had. And then just a sliver of sun came up, and we saw that we weren't alone. 18,000 of our closest friends were there. They got really skinny legs, and they're really tall, and they've flown 1,500 miles to get there and stand in that water. And they're all in family groupings. There's always a male and a female and a baby. And so that's been going on for thousands of years. And when the sun gets up just a sliver, somebody gives the signal to these birds that have been sleeping overnight in this cold water and says, OK, boys, it's time for breakfast. And 18,000 of them take flight in the same second and fly over your head, a mother and a father anthropomorphically, and a baby. 6,000 bunches of threes. And they've been doing it long before we ever got here. And they'll be doing it long after we're all gone. And for a second you realize the care of God for the creation. Anything wrong with the creation, we did. Anything good about the creation, God did. And here's 6,000 families of these skinny little birds flying over you, you can see their faces straining, you can hear their wings flapping. This is not doing as bad, their back pocket. But they do it every day, because they gotta get food, then they'll come back and have a long nap overnight. But standing there a minute before that happened, I would have thought we had wasted our morning. Dark, cold snow, not seeing anything when in fact all this life was out there, just waiting for the right moment. Sometimes I think a word of God can come from the creation, which is God's creation, and remind us of the care of God and the providence of God, even when we cannot see any way forward. The psalmist says, God, your word is like a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. I really do believe that sometimes that word comes from individuals, from friends, from people who speak the right word to us at the right moment. I really do believe that sometimes that word comes from simply knowing this book of ours well. There's more wisdom in the first verse of the first psalm than in most of what I studied for four years in college and three years in seminary. The way we get in trouble is gradually, and the way we get out of trouble is gradually. If we could have internalized that early on, we might all be happier. And sometimes that word of God, which sheds light on our path, I really do believe comes from simply being in touch with the creation in a way that it's not there to be exploited or to make money from. It's there to receive as a gift the one who started it all in the first place. Sometimes that light shines on a path and we say, my God, I was actually doing the right thing. This is a good day. Sometimes the light comes on and we go, my God, how could I have gotten this lost? And sometimes the light comes on and simply reminds us that there is a path ahead, even when it's impossible for us to see it. My prayer for each of us today, starting with myself and trying to be unselfish as possible, including all of you, my prayer for each of us is that in the days ahead, there'll be enough light in our lives to be reminded of God's providence and care, that there'll be enough light in our lives that we can actually see and name and love those companions that we share on this journey. And there'll be enough light in our lives that we can actually walk one step at a time, one day at a time, 
toward the place that God is inviting us to be. That's my prayer for myself and for each of you and for all of you together. And for that, I say thanks be to God. Amen. If you are able, please stand and sing the next hymn, which somehow miraculously is called, Thy Word is a Lamp Unto My Feet.